Welcome back in today. We're going to be diving back into the Top Buffs countdown. We already talked about our 2024 honorable mentions and started the list going from 30 to 40. Today, we're going to tackle the guys that we ranked from 20 to 29th. William, before we jump into that, just how was your summer going? And uh, we were talking before we hit record here. It's like the juices are starting to get flown a little bit. We're getting closer and closer to the season. And I think this countdown kind of gets yeah. me into that that mindset. Well, I, I think this re- this past weekend, the recruiting weekend, and and just man, they 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 just they just orchestrated that thing like like Mozart. You know, it was just every little. It was so exciting, and I wasn't even there. You know, and and there was things going on there, going to see Peggy, and the kids are doing this and they're doing that, and that. I got to tell you, man, that that picture of Shador handing the keys to Juju in the throne sent chills, just chills. <laughs> I was like, so I, it's got me excited, you know. And then I'm looking at the video we just did the Chauncey Gooden. Uh, breakdown and looking at his video and and got me thinking about the offensive line and um, you know watching some of the one on one the intensity of the one on ones in practice this summer uh, it is just marvelous to me and that's great too because this next group of top buffs that we have to talk about there are a lot of defensive and offensive linemen that we're going to dive into but before we close out on Juju Lewis if he commits. We got to get down to the sink and give our review of the Juju Precision Pass Burger, yeah. right? Well, we need to do that whether he commits or not, man. I need, I, I need to try one of those. It looked pretty damn good. <laughs> it did look good. His, hey. to, to see the, the Boulder Theater, you know, yeah. put out a, a recruiting sales pitch, well, I, maybe- I really didn't think – you know, it, Boulder will always have a little bit of this divide from the academic side, but – there, there are more people rowing their boats in a positive direction with Colorado football right now than I can remember. And and you were back around in the '90s, so maybe it was like that back then. But it's been a while since it's been like this. You know, there were there was still there was still a lot of divide between Coach Mack and some of the academic people. But but you know, real quick before I forget it, I think maybe we need to do a, a podcast tour of uh, uh, diners and our little diners and drive-ins and whatever like that show on. Yeah. You know, or uh, breakdown of burgers. But uh, the thing about Prime is that, you know, it's clear that he's reached out to the academic side and the professors and that he takes them seriously and that he's a serious man. And he he just the kind of a guy that makes you feel good to be around him. And I, and, and I think we're seeing that um, from the academic side as well, you know, and, and that the, the whole football program is taking the academics very seriously. And I think that's really all the professors really want, you know, just take what we're doing seriously. Definitely. And that that's one thing that has been great to see. And uh, Coach Prime definitely gets it from uh, a perception standpoint. And also because of his personality, he uh, can make few people feel really good to be in his presence. And we've definitely seen that a lot the last year and a half. What Coach Prime said following the 2023 season is we got to get better at running the football. We got to get better at stopping the run. And so that leads us into 29 on our 2024 top us countdown. And that's defensive line transfer Torian Carter. I had him 33rd. William, you had him 19th. Brian at 30, 6'3, 303. He looks all of that. <laughs> looks all of that 303. Uh, and he was trending upwards w- within the Razorbacks program before transferring to CU this spring. Has now played in 33 collegiate games, one year of eligibility left. He's got a sense of urgency. What What are your expectations for Torian Carter this season? Well, I have I have high expectations from him. I you know you know it's it's sort of funny. He's listed six three three oh three. I think he's probably bigger than that from from my eyeball on him. But you know, the crazy thing, he's kind of one of the smaller guys <laughs> this year. But uh, I think you know, given the fact that he's played, he's played in the SEC and he's got some playing time behind him, and um, you know, he made five starts at Arkansas, played thirty three games there, and um, he does a little bit of everything. He's kind of a workman like guy up front, um, you know. Uh, so I, I think he can, he can, you know, draw a double team and, and take up blockers, and I think he can get in the backfield and, and make things happen. Um, you know, I, I think any time. Probably almost any time in the last 10 years, he'd have been our top defensive lineman, and he's not this year. Uh, so that's exciting to me to have him as sort of a uh, – I don't know that anybody's 
somebody will be a starter clearly in the first play of the game, but I think they're going to rotate platoon guys so much that the starter designation probably won't matter a whole lot. But I do think that um, um, Torian Carter is going to be a guy that plays a lot and makes a big, big darn difference on this defensive line. He and Anquin Barnes are probably the guys that are not going to really pop off the stat sheet, but are going to be the guys that uh, are asked to be the grunt workers in there, right, this year? Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, um, I, I think Anquan Barnes with his size might actually be a guy, you know, that, that if he if the lights come on for him, you know, they're not going to be able to single block him and, and he can get in the backfield stuff. But, you know, I think people misunderstand the defensive line a lot and they think if he's not making a lot of tackles or tackles for losses or sacks, he's not getting the job done. But, you know, a lot of times you want your defensive line to eat up blockers and let the linebackers – to get the job done, and then you might have one or two defensive linemen that are the guys that you expect to to make all those plays. Um, and I don't know quite what um, Livingston is going to do with our defense in terms of does he want a, a penetrating get through the gaps defensive line? I don't know that yet, so we'll we'll wait and see. But um, I think Tory and Carter. Uh, uh, it's like it's like I've talked about uh, Shane Coates from last year it was a lot more effective than people thought because he didn't show up in the in a stat line, but a lot of things he did allowed other people to get sacks and make plays. So I think Torian Carter is another guy like that. Up next is a guy that should get some stats this year, and that's 28, Arden Walker off the edge. I had him 29th. William, you had him 21st on your list. And Brian also at 29th, like I did. Graded out pretty well last season, ranked fourth on the defense in pressures. A former, former Missouri transfer that came back home. Obviously, he went to Cherry Creek High School. We didn't see him out there this spring. He had a, a hand injury, but we've seen him get back there for summer strength and conditioning program. Uh, uh, played 199 defensive snaps last year. And... I would maybe expect that number to be about the same, not because Arden Walker hasn't gotten better, but just because you've brought in Okanlola, and Morgan. Hayes, Nikhil yeah. Webb Walker, I, T Tajay McCoy is part of that mix. I think you're just going to have more healthy competition at that position. That's why I had him 29th, even though, you know, at the end of last season, I would have maybe projected it higher. It's just that they brought in a lot of players on the edge. One of the things I liked about him, even though he wasn't playing in the spring, and that he was always out there, and he, a lot of times he was working with Taj McCoy and giving him hints. To, to, he was kind of like a, 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 another assistant coach working with some of the younger guys, even though he couldn't play. So I like his leadership. Um, I think Arden Walker is a special player, and I think he's a, he he looked very. He, there were moments last year where he looked really good. Um, and I think that we're going to see more of that this year, and he'll get plugged into situations uh, that, that fit his uh, particular playing style, what have you. And I think he's going to benefit from having some of those big boys inside eating up blockers. And I think Arden Walker is a guy who could be very surprising on this team, uh, you know, where, uh, like you said, even though if he doesn't play more, he might be more effective and make more plays. I don't know if that even makes sense. Play won't play as much, but he'll make more plays. Um you know, I guess uh, that that's what Nippy's thirteen and board calls havoc rate or something like that. Um, but I, I well, he had a pretty good havoc rate last year. Like I mentioned, he was fourth on the defense and pressures and played less than two, just short of two hundred defensive snaps. Right. So his pressures per snap ratio uh, was up there with anybody. Uh, right. You know, probably if I went back and ran the numbers, might be number one on the defense. Yeah, and I think that uh, you know uh, people tend to take, like, they'll say, well, you know, Jimmy Gilbert had 10 sacks in 2016, right? Well, there was a lot of other guys doing a lot of stuff on that defense, right? He wasn't the only one there. And, and Art Walker's kind of one of those guys, he's not going to get the the notoriety, but he's he's doing things quietly that make a defense very effective. So I, I think he is an excellent player and a and, uh, real asset to this team. And he's always, you mentioned his leadership. He's one of those guys that you just yeah. love having in the locker room, uh, a great personality. and. Um, one of the guys that kind of bucks this notion that there was last year about Coach Prime doesn't want local kids. They, right. They've they integrated some of those local guys to be big parts of this program. Orton Walker's part of the mix. And we've seen some offers go out to, to local high school recruits as well. So they're not ignoring in-state, but Colorado's recruiting on a different level right now. And you're just not going to be able to take more than one or two guys from in-state every year. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I can't talk about Arden without talking about his dad and Arthur, who who 
was one, one of the H boys, one of the legendary guys in the late eighties and early nineties and played defensive tackle for the buffs. And, and he had that kind of life larger than life personality too. He was always singing and, you know, pumping people up and, and, uh, Created havoc of his own from a from a, a, a defensive tackle, you know, defensive end position, um, and, and it's just exciting to have his. I don't know, it makes me feel old, I guess, but uh, have his kid be uh, three or four years into his college uh, program and doing pretty well too. All right, number twenty seven is running back Micah Welch. We all were pretty close in our rankings of him. Uh, I had him twenty sixth. William, you had him at thirtieth and Brian at 22nd, so all in kind of that that middle range of this countdown. Uh, one of the most talked about players during spring ball, of course, his uh, his battles with Shiloh Sanders on, on well-off media and reached people were, uh, was much watch uh, streaming YouTube video, uh, but also because this is there's a major overhaul in this offensive line right, or uh, at running back now, so – Michael Welch, all of a sudden, he comes in as maybe this early enrollee that you expect to take some time and maybe be part of the mix to all of a sudden, right now, after his spring, he could potentially be their starting running back. Yeah, and I think he showed in the spring that he's able to play with the big boys and, and get the job done. And um, he has good vision. He knows the offense, uh, you know, which is, you know, not for that's not nothing because, you know, how many guys we've seen come through this program who didn't learn the dang offense year after year? Michael Wells knows it within two months and, and is knows it well enough to really show out in spring. Um, you know, uh, I guess I might as well list him as a replacement for uh, any one of the guys that left, but uh, his performance in spring was fantastic. You know, the one play running over Shiloh and whatever he runs physically, he kind of runs like a bowling ball to me, you know, he's just so kind of so low uh, and, and, and got the momentum and the power and he's not huge, but uh, he's big enough. And, you know, when, when a guy with his size hits you low, you know, he's going to have an advantage. So he's got moves. He's got, he, you know, I don't think he's got the breakaway speed, but he's got good vision. He's going to, he's, he's a guy that I think is always going to make positive yardage for you. So I'm I'm pretty excited about him. You know, we I think we talked about in the last segment um, one of the, one of the running backs was in that group, and you know I said several times any one of these four guys could be the guy, and it may be different every week this season. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to me to see uh, what they do with these guys and who who leaps to the forefront. Yeah, I've said this a few times. All I have to do is think back to the Colorado's game against Arizona last season to get excited about Michael Welch's potential because you mentioned that he's a bowling ball type running back. Arizona had two of those guys and they just wore down the Buffs defense as that game went along. That was a close football game. Uh, for a lot of it, the Buffs outplayed the Wildcats, but at the end of that game, they were on the short end of that scoreboard because Arizona's ground game really kind of wore down Colorado's defense. And so you have Augusta have come in with size and Dallin Hayden with size and, um, right. Colton Hood's just only going to get stronger as he's in a college program because he's a, a true freshman right now. So they've kind of developed this running back group that I think is going to be able to wear down defenses. And uh, I was really disappointed that we didn't get a chance to see Michael Welch in the spring game. He was out with a minor injury for that because I was anxious to see what he looked like his first time in front of fans. But Isaiah, uh, Isaiah Harge comes over from cornerback and he gets some running lanes. So yeah. That looks a little different than what we saw last year, and, and I know it's only a spring game, but uh, it does make you a little bit excited about the potential of some of these backs behind uh, a better offensive line. Yeah, that was, I was thinking it's thinking it's uh, you know watching watching a kid like Michael Wells behind these ginormous freaking guys we're going to have up front this year, and he you know he's going to kind of get he's one of those running backs who can kind of get lost behind the size of those guys. And he, and he just, all of a sudden there he is like Eric the enemy, you know, squirting through a hole and whatever. And, and, you know, you might try to you put an arm out to try to stop him. You might get a busted arm, you know? <laughs> so uh, he's going to be fun to watch. Um, you know, you know, obviously I'll be watching those guys up front, but, but he'll be a fun one to watch behind those guys because I think he'll take advantage of their abilities. All right. You ready for this one? Number 26. Is this coming Hunter. Just coming with an apology because there was a, there was a comment made last time. I'm just saying. Well, let me finish here. Okay. Number 26 is Mark Vissette. I had him 14th. William, you had him 32. Brian, 31. I have him like 
what is that? 18 spots ahead of you. Why why am I having to issue, issue an apology here? I don't know. You, 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 you mentioned something about I don't vote for kickers or something like that. Well, it's been kind of a long-standing joke because it actually is rooted in truth. You would not vote for punters and kickers for a very long time. So uh, you can you can now uh, put a gold star on on your chest if you want right. over ranking Mark Vissette at thirty two. But I'd still contend that that's too low. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, but Brian's right there with me at thirty one. So maybe you're maybe both haters. You're kind of the outlier, man. I don't know. You're out there. You're out there. I don't know, partying and smoking and whatever. And me and Brian are kind of the conservative. Let's put people where they belong, guys. All right. Well, that's that. That's um, that, I'm just going to skip past that. Uh, yeah, you're speechless. I, I, I put I put this list together with a very sound mind, and actually, to add on to that, William, I had Mark Vissette on my re-ranked top ten at number nine last year. I thought he was the ninth best football player on the team. Now, is the punter the most valuable position on a team? No, but when you have a job to do and you do it as well as Mark Vissette did last year, ranking first in the Pac-12 with 20 punts inside the 20, uh, first team all-conference selection by PFF, I'm going to give you a little bit more love. I'm just going to do it. No, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, I think, you know, punter is very important. Um but I think, you know, it's the same thing we talked about last week is, is who am I going to move down to move him up? It's like, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of better players on this team this year. Um, and, and at the end of the day, you know, while a punter is critically important, you know, you know, he, he's, he plays a lot less than other guys and only does one thing. So I don't know, you know, that I, 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 I put him in there because I think he belongs in there, but uh, I couldn't justify putting him any higher. Yeah, I, I, I'm having more fun with you than actually criticizing you. But he, here's a a real question for you. Okay, so in that Stanford game, you probably don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about it, but that was almost the Mark Vissette game. He pinned down Stanford at the one-yard line was less than three minutes. Colorado has a three-point lead. If they get a stop there, are you ranking him higher this year? Because I think that would have been a moment in that season where um, maybe things don't tailspin quite as much if you don't blow a 29 point lead. Yeah. If you win that game, there's going to definitely be some issues and things that were exploited in the second half of that football game. But maybe you find a way to get another win down the stretch. If you have that carrot to bowl eligibility in front of you. I mean, I don't think, you know, when I was putting, when I put together the list, I don't, I didn't really generally think back to last year too much about stuff. I think I'm, um, you know, very, very, it's very clear what the set is able to do. And some of those kicks, I mean, it was, that wasn't the only one. I mean, he, I yeah. swear to God, just the, sometimes the ball had eyes on it last year when he was kicking it. It, it, it was the craziest damn thing I, I think I'd seen in a long time with punters. But, you know, back in the McCarty days, um, you know, we had one All America punter after another. I think we had three or four in a row at one point. Barry Helton and, uh, uh, now I'm blanking. Um, getting old but you know that was a that was a key uh element of those great mccartney teams was we always had a punter who could change the field you know and that's a big that's a big damn deal yeah and so yeah i i, I think you could have an argument that i was too high and maybe you were too low but that's the beauty of this countdown he comes in at 26 probably a good spot for uh, you know, a potential all-conference guy at his position, be, just being a specialist, uh, former transfer from Louisville. He's statistically one of the best punters in, in Cardinals history uh, with another strong season in Boulder. I mean, you could start to make that case for him at Colorado as well. All right. I think we spent enough time there. Uh, let's move up to 25 where we have offensive lineman Tyler Johnson. I had him at 17. You had him at 18th. Brian didn't rank him. I have to say, William, this was one of the harder guys – for me to peg into a spot because he was not healthy this spring, but he right. came in with such a great resume. Yeah. And I think looking at, look at, um, at, at his play before he got to uh, Colorado, I think I had him listed as my highest ranked offensive lineman or one of them. I don't know. I can't remember who else I had up there. Um, but I, I still think he's one of the best offensive linemen on this team. Um, and he didn't get a chance to show it um, th this particular spring, but um, I think he's a guy, it's not a, it's not a you know 
I think I, I think to myself, I think he could be a starter, one of those guard spots. And I'm like, who the hell is going to beat Tyler Brown? Are they going to beat uh, uh, Justin Mayers? I mean, those are three really outstanding football players. Um, and I think Tyler Johnson brings so much. And I think he also could play one of the tackle spots as well. So I, I think he's a well-rounded offensive lineman who's got a lot of playing time behind him. Um, and I don't think that that uh, uh, battle for the starting spots up front is done yet. Yeah. Again, to your point, he would have ranked higher than 25th had we done this going into spring ball because he was a four-star transfer, ranked number five among all interior offensive line transfers this offseason. Uh, this one really jumped off the page when I was researching him when he committed. According to PFF, Johnson's only allowed two sacks across 890 career pass block snaps at the collegiate level. He spent some time at Texas early on before transferring to Houston, so he's got that resume. It's just until you see it with your own eyes. And to your point, we've seen Tyler Brand out there and Justin Mayer's competing. And so uh, until we get J Tyler Johnson out there uh, getting some reps with the ones, it's hard to have him much higher on this list. Yeah. Uh, and he's, he's six, five, three six, five, three and a quarter, three thirty. You know, he needs just another ginormous guy out there. One, one little trivia point that he was the starting right guard in the Alamo bowl against us when he played at Texas. Um, I thought that was fun, but uh you know, what was it? Is it fun though? Is it really? <laughs> well, it's fun now. It wasn't fun then. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but uh, it, it, it just sort of—I think it just sort of goes to show. Um, um, uh, I, I, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm blanking out. Like, but just—he's got that. He's got that pedigree. He knows. He knows. Texas, Texas was pretty solid that year. I was surprised uh, they fired their head coach after that season because they were just dominant against. See you in that game. Oh yeah, yeah, big time. And, and I think he was he was a part of that. But I guess my point is that you know he's been playing a lot at a high level for quite some time, and yeah. so I, people don't know about him. Number one, because he's an offensive lineman. Number two, because he wasn't playing in the spring. But I think I I would be very surprising to me if Tyler Johnson isn't in the mix for one of those starting spots. And I you know and if 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 Seaton struggles, I think he's a guy that could play that left tackle too. You know, so he gives options to load hold. Um, inside there, and you know, it's very rare to go through a season and have an offensive line not have somebody hurt along the way. So he's another guy that gives you serious starter. You know, like like I said earlier, at some point, you know, we're gonna have a we're gonna have a starting caliber guy standing on the sidelines, no matter how yeah. this, you know, and more than one probably. Well, I've always hated when O line coaches have a rotation in there. I feel like that's one group where you just need to get those five guys in sync as much as possible. Uh, this might be one case, though, if Tyler Johnson's healthy and running through camp, that maybe you do give a, a couple weeks to, to rotate, him, rotate him in there and kind of find out who's the best on game day. Would you be okay with that? I think it depends on your on your chemistry of your team. And, you know, if you've got – to me, if, you, if you've – I go back to 2001 a lot, but, you know, they ultimately uh, moved um, – I can't remember who they, they they did a little switch switcheroo and uh, moved uh, one of the guys to center and that's when it all of a sudden clicked you know so if they're not clicking and you need to make a change he's a guy you could ought to, ought to obviously put into one of those spots to see if you get better chemistry but yeah. I think if you got five guys that are playing well and kicking backside then you you don't leave, you don't mess with that man yeah even in 2016 their last 10 win season we saw them rotate at right tackle pretty much the whole season through with Sam Cron Sage. And who else was out there? Jonathan Huckins? No, he was interior guy. They were no. rotating on the uh, out of tackle, though. Uh, was it um, the African kid? Um, I can't remember. Anyway. It'll come back to us. Um, yeah. All right, number 24 on the list is offensive lineman Hank Solinskis. I said that we probably would have had Tyler Johnson higher on our list going into spring ball. Hank Solinskis is, is a riser. I feel yeah. like based on what he did this spring, I had him 25th, you had him 22nd and Brian at 26. So we're all pretty much in that same area. This is a good story. Again, another local guy, Cherry Creek high school committed to Carl Durrell. Deion Sanders takes over and, and he and his staff decided to keep Hank Zelenskis on board. And it worked out really well for them. Last year he played in 11 games, started a couple games. We saw him in a traditional center role. We saw him as, uh, kind of a, a jumbo tight end in short yard situations. And and now, as Pat Shermer said this spring, he's the front runner right now. He said during spring ball, if we play tomorrow, 
Uh, Hank Solinskis would be our starting center. And I don't think we've seen anything since then that would have changed that. What What are your thoughts there? Well, I think, uh, I think most everybody on the board pretty much wrote in you carry Walker as a starter because he'd been a starter in Connecticut before that. But I think it also discounted uh, the abilities of Hank Solinskis and, I, I do feel like there's a little bit of a bias on the board towards the in-state guys. Like, yeah, hey, they can't be that good. They're from Colorado. Um, but Hank Zelenskis is the real darn deal. And he looked good last season. And he's And he's solid in there. And I love his technique is really coming along, um, you know, and, and uh, he's meshing well with those guards. And he just really does everything quite well. I think he's a guy, you know, it's probably too early to say it, but you know, if he keeps growing, he's he's possibly got a future at the next level too. I think he's just a darn good player and he does everything right. You know, now I, I will say that uh Yakiri Walker keeps jumping out of me this summer in those one on one drills because he's working his backside off. He ain't just giving it up. Okay. And I gotta credit him for that. And that's gonna make Zelenskis better, the you know, the harder they both work for it. Um, I like that. But uh I, I still think it's it's Hank's position to lose. And I think he's a super effective center and one of the better ones in the conference. Yeah, definitely. I'm looking up uh 2016 just to close out that uh Aaron Hagler is the other one that okay. was starting at right tackle that season. Not many people care, but that would have been one of those things that would have been bugging me the rest of today if I didn't look it up. Uh, but just to stick with Hank Zelinskis, being a center just runs in his family. His father played center for Troy Aikman. He's got an older brother that plays at Rutgers. He's got a younger brother that's a center prospect at Cherry Creek. Uh, that's just what you do in the Zelinskis household is uh, you snap the ball and protect the quarterback and create some running lanes. Yeah, and uh, I, I it, that, it's kind of fun um, to, to look at it in that perspective, and I think he – uh, you know, I may turn out to be the best of them. You know, I, when your father played that position, you know, uh, at that high of a level, you get a lot of tips and teaching on, along the way. And, uh, um, you know, centers don't have to be as huge and ginormous, but they have a different set of skills that, that are not easily um, copied. You know, when you people think it's just, the, ah, it's easy, snap the ball. Well, you know, okay, you got, you got this, 325 pound Volkswagen three inches from your head for one thing uh who wants to kill you we, we remember the demonstration when we did uh the podcast in person together right <laughs> and uh yeah you know and and you you know one of the things that a lot of guys struggle with is that snapping is a backward motion but at the same time you got to have that other hand in your feet with a forward motion and some guy can't do it. So uh, I think he's exciting. I, I like I see I, I like seeing him getting closer to 300. I think he might be over 300 at this point, but uh, that's going to give plenty of size up in there to get the job done. And uh, you know he's going to be flanked by huge guards. And I don't know that people know, understand why that makes such a big difference. But generally speaking, the guard is going to go one on one with anybody that's lined up over them. And the center is going to be helping one of the other guys. So if you've got 325 pound guards on either side, and, and you scheme yourself so that your center doesn't have to take on those guys one-on-one. -on -one. He, he becomes a helper and can get up to the next level and things like that. So that's why your centers can tend to be a, a little bit smaller guys. But, you know, when you have, you know, undersized guards, everybody's going to get their butt kicked. All right. Up next on the top of countdown is 23. Trevor Woods played safety earlier in his career at CU, expected to play linebacker currently this coming season. I had him at 19th. William, you had him lowest at 27th, and Brian at 21. Uh, this is one of those rankings to me that really signifies that Colorado's defense has vastly improved its overall talent because you know Trevor Woods, uh, a proven playmaker, coming in this low on the list. I, I know there's a reason, though, that you had him a little bit lower on your All list, right. uh, so I'll let you go. Yeah, and I talked about I, I think I sent when I sent my thing in, I said, you know, if he was playing safety straight up, I'd have him a lot higher. I'd I'd probably have him, you know, closer to ten, somewhere around there. But I just don't, you know, I think as a linebacker, you're taking away his best skill set. You're putting him in a position he's not naturally built for. Now he's doing a, a decent enough job, but I'm not sure if he's gonna end up being the uh a starter at that spot. Um, but I think if he was at safety, I'd have him um at least 10 spots higher, if not more, um, because I think that's his natural position. I think they got him playing out of position for the benefit of the team at this point. So that that's sort of where I, why I dropped him down in that ranking, because I don't think he's really a linebacker to me. 
Well, one of the reasons I didn't go as low as you is, first off, I agree with you that I felt like he looked like a fish out of water playing linebacker last season. But we also heard that he really was still meeting with the safeties during the week and then going to play linebacker on Saturdays. And so I think Trevor Woods being a really high football IQ player, focusing more on that will make him look more natural in that position. But I also then would point to his versatility in the sense that if there's injuries at safety, okay, Trevor Woods has played so much safety. He knows that position like the back of his hand. You move him back. Um, if there's injuries at linebacker, all of a sudden he becomes more valuable at that position. Um, and again, I think with focusing more on that this offseason, that's going to help him be better at the position. Um, so I just think he is, you know, you look at his past, he's created six turnovers. Of course, he had that uh he blocked a punt, returned his own blocked punt for a touchdown. Uh, yeah. He's just a playmaker. He's like Shiloh Sanders in the sense that he's going to give up a play here or there. But at the end of the day, he's going to make enough momentum changing plays to make him a plus player out there on the field. And he had two game saving end zone touch interceptions last year, one against TCU and one against Colorado State, right? In my yeah, the TCU was in in the first half, but it was still a, a big play in that football game. Absolutely. Game that came down to you know, yeah. fewer than six points. That's a game winning play, right? You know, yeah. uh, and, and a momentum shifter. Um, I think it'll probably also help him. You know that we've brought in some other linebackers that can play, and he doesn't have to be like the main guy. And we talked a little bit about um, 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 Brown, the other linebacker Brown, on our last group, um, and uh, how how good he Jeremiah was Brown, yeah. Brown. I was thinking Jerome. I don't know. I knew that wasn't right. Jeremiah Brown, how good he looked out in space in the spring game. And I think that Trevor Woods is, is a similar kind of guy that you can put him into situations where you can really accentuate his uh, uh, skill set. You know, I, I think if, if, if Utah is running the eye, the, 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 you know, eye formation between the tackles, he's not the guy I want in there. Um, you know, there's other guys I'd rather have in there, but he gives you versatility on your defense and gives you different packages and things you can do. And he's a great football player. I mean, you know, and I, I don't want to dis. I'm not trying to discredit that. He's a hell of a football player. Yeah. He's, All right. He, number. He, he, he just makes me think of um um uh uh Tedrick Thompson. You know, was a guy just ended up where the ball was a lot. You know. Some guys just have a knack for it. Yeah. You know, and he does so. Anxious to see what he is able to contribute this year. Number 22, we know, is going to be a vocal member of this Colorado football team in 2024. In fact, he's already has been since he stepped foot on campus, even on his official visit. The creator of DT2, Don't Touch 2, Khalil Benson on the offensive line comes in at 22. Item 20th, you had him 13th, Brian at 28th. Uh, his competitiveness is just on, on a different level, isn't it? Yeah, and I'm at, I'm just going to say this. He's the best offensive lineman on this team. He's got the size, and and I was super impressed with his technique in the spring game, and and even more so watching him in the in the in the summer. You know, in that that video a couple weeks ago, um, when one of the guys challenged him, and he ended up in his face, and he he he's just not going to let that lie. You know, so uh, given his size and and athleticism and what have you, I think he's going to be a stellar offensive tackle for us, and, and I just think he's going to be one of the top offensive linemen in, in the conference. Yeah, no doubt. I I could watch to your point one on ones of Benson and Deion Hayes going at each other all day. That was kind of like in the the springtime when we had Micah and uh, Shiloh Sanders going at each other. That that's just two dogs going at each other and barking back and forth, you know, and not backing down. You know, that's what I'm saying about the attitude of this offensive line. Um, you know, uh, is entirely different from last year, and and you know the guys like. Uh, um, Justin Mayers and Khalil Benson are just warriors, man. You know, they're going to come out and try to smash you to the ground every single play. And uh, seeing him go up against good pass rushers in spring and summer and just uh, his his pass protection technique has really come along and he just really looks pretty out there. And, you know, there's one play from the spring game um, that everybody was looking at for Jordan Seaton, um, which he looked pretty nice. But what people didn't watch was how perfect – uh, Khalil Benson was on the other side in his pass protection uh, 
technique. It was just beautiful to watch. So I think people are going to finally, you know, we've been a long time waiting on, we've been a long time waiting on some good tackles, man. I think we might be there. <laughs> yeah. All right, number 21, sticking in the trenches, is defensive lineman Amari McNeil. I had him 22nd. You had him 28th. Brian, very high on Amari McNeil, which I can get based on what he did as last season progressed. Brian had him number 10 on his list. Uh, he was actually graded by PFF as the Buffs' best interior defense alignment last season. That was his first season in tra after transferring from Tennessee. Uh, had three sacks, which was third most on the team. Uh, a side note there, William, I think CU's third-ranked sack man in 2024 is going to have more than, than three sacks on his record. Yeah, I would imagine so, and it's going to be it's going to be a, a, an edge guy. I'm thinking this year, but like you know, it's funny to me because I am super high on Amari McNeil as, as well, and I have been since like, I've been. A, I was a good guy as the season was going along, saying this guy is coming along. You need to watch this guy. Um, and I only had him 28th here, and the reason is because the guys we brought in, you know, I mean, I'm, you know. He's somebody. These guys are going to fight like it's going to be like bull elephants out there. Who's going to get the playing time? You know, and and uh, it's not a knock on Amari McNeil. Um, when you look at some of the guys we brought in here, Chidozi Awuzie, and and you know um, some of these guys that we brought in, Torian Carter and and others, uh, I only knocked him down a little bit because of the competition we brought in. But I still think he's a fantastic player and one of the better defensive tackles in the conference. Yeah, and, and he's a junior now. So this is when you expect Amari McNeil's game to really take off. And so I, I can't wait to see what that look like. But looks like. But yeah, I don't think we're gonna see a dramatic dramatic increase in his snaps because he played 426 last year. So I'm kind of on board with you there, but uh gonna be a big part of that rotation. And last in this group of top buffs is number 20 offensive lineman, Tyler Brown. William, you mentioned that you think Leo Benson is your favorite offensive lineman on this team. Uh, you and I both had Khalil Benson ranked higher than Tyler Brown on our list, but Brian had him uh, at number 15, so that's why he's up here at 20. Um, I was talking with Uncle Neely, and he's, he thinks Tyler Brown's the strongest guy on the team. I think Chidozi yes. Wanko is, is part of that discussion as well. Uh, but Tyler Brown's part of the leadership council. Uh, he's a big leader on that team. He was a third-team FCS All-American, and – Above all else, uh, FCS All-American at Jackson State in 2022, but above all else, is this is a, a hungry football player. He was yeah. not allowed to do the thing that he loves to do last year. And this is a warrior, like you mentioned, uh, of Justin Mayers and Khalil Benson. you got to throw Tyler Brown in that mix, too. And uh, he's, he's going to be anxious to get out there and throw some bodies around because he wasn't able to last year. And I, and I think, you know, if you have it, – it, uh, it, I think Khalil Benson and Justin Mayers are very close. As I think Justin Mayers could be our best offensive lineman too, because he's just a fantastic guard, and and I can't see anybody taking his spot away from him. Tyler Brown is a guy, man. If you can't cheer for this guy, if you can't get on board with Tyler Brown, there's something wrong with you. You need to go cheer for another damn sport, man. Because you watch this guy; he's always the hardest working guy out there. Like like Uncle Neely said, and by, and by the way, that that interview with Uncle Neely was interesting as hell. That was that was a really great interview. I really enjoyed that. Um, but uh, him talking about you know uh, unequivocally, no questions asked. Tyler Brown's the strongest guy on this team. Well, I don't doubt it. You know, um, my only and I still have lingering question marks about Tyler. He was great at Jackson State, but we haven't seen him really play at this level yet. So I still think there's a question mark to me. I don't. I don't think it's a big question mark. I think he's going to be just fine. But until I see him out there, you know, against our level of guys, um, I still will have a little bit of question mark about that. But there's nobody with greater work ethic. He certainly looks the part. You know, he works his the hard and um, great leader and uh, physical and violent. So I just like a lot of uh, things about Tyler Brown, and I hope his game lives up to all the other wonderful parts of who he is as a person. Definitely. All right. Well, we are halfway through the 2024 Top Buffs Countdown. Be sure to check in with our next segment as we get into the top 20. And if you haven't heard our previous 
two segments. Again, we talked about the honorable mentions and we went uh, from 30 to 40 as well. So uh, we'll be back with William shortly and we're going to continue down the path of ranking the top ups. <laughs>